from Beachborough, Pastor Daryl Elliott. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give Pastor Salonor all the time he needs. Let's give him a round of applause. Hallelujah. Appreciate the performance last night in <clears throat> Hamilton Church. Really makes me proud to be a part of what God's doing here in New Zealand. Have your Bibles, uh, Revelations chapter 2. Revelations chapter 2. We're going to read verse 1 to verse 7. <clears throat> and if you're taking notes, the title of my sermon is The Love is Gone. Let's read, starting at verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and he who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, and I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from all its places unless you repent. Verse 6. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and to him who overcomes. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, God. What an honor that I could stand before this assembly. As I submit this sermon... To them, I'm asking your anointing. Begin to cause every heart to be tender in your presence. Uh, we give you liberty, the right of way, and all that you desire to do. Let it be done in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. The love is gone. I just finished reading a revealing revelation written by Amir Sarfati. And here's an excerpt from the book. Uh, he writes... The first century Roman Empire was a letter-written society. And 22 of the 27 New Testament books take that form. Revelation is no different. John is about to send to the churches what he knows is a letter that is unique from its predecessors. And as he's writing, it is well past the time that Paul and Peter put pen to paper in fact, they had been dead for decades. There is one last edition yet to be written, a conclusion to touch on what had passed and what was happening at the present time, but would also focus on what God had planned for the future. And once that was included, then the message that the Lord wanted to communicate to humanity would be complete. And Revelation was the final touch. The Bible is officially completed. It's a great book to add on the bookshelf along with other books that you might have on eschatology. Now the first letter written to the church of Ephesus, the church John is currently pastoring. All seven letters written to the churches in Revelations addresses a deep concern in the body of Christ. My focus this morning is the church of Ephesus. It had all the right mechanics, nevertheless. Now imagine sitting in a service and your pastor starts his sermon by saying, I have a letter I'm going to read to you. A message from the Savior, Jesus himself. They say the best public speeches are the ones when people comment, you should have been there. This sermon is one of those best public speeches. You should have been there. This sermon would be the talk of the town for weeks and months and years to come. 
The best sermons are the ones that gets people on the edge of their seats when nothing can distract the listeners like sweet melody to the ears and words that make the heart sing. When a preacher has a word from heaven, people will lock on to every word. And that morning service in Ephesus, John has their attention. And all eyes are fixated on him, ears wide open. Read on, Pastor. To the church of Ephesus, right. And yes, God has been keeping good records on us. And verse 2 and 3, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience, have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. And that sounds like a good church to me. And verse 4 starts with, nevertheless. The letter written to Ephesus highlights the good and the bad. A church with a great testimony, actively engaged, focused on the mission, nevertheless. I know your works, your labor, your patience, nevertheless. I cannot, you cannot bear those who are evil, nevertheless. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, nevertheless. You have persevered and have patience, nevertheless. You labor for my, my name's sake, You've not become weary, nevertheless. If there's one thing that I've observed over the years of pastoring, that is church people can get a lot of things right. Just like the church in Ephesus, you can check the boxes in all the right places. Uh, friendliness, check. Uh, dedication, check. Uh, great atmosphere, check, and so on. And yet a single flaw is enough to kill the spirit of revival in the congregation. And verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. The translation can be different for some people. You lost the love you had for me in the beginning. You don't love me the way you used to. You don't love me as you did at first. When John took over the work from Paul, it had all the mechanics working in an established church, uh, saints uh, faithfully serving, saints actively engaging, the right doctrine, total focus on the mission. Nevertheless, it had one major problem. It had a heart problem. The saints of God have left their first love. Now, in a setting like this, a crowd this size, some of you have the routine down, the church thing. You show up to church, you clap your hands, you sing, you worship, you drop a few dollars in the offering basket, you have tea after service, you go home, and then you repeat the church thing. But the fire and the excitement is missing. It's a heart problem. You lost the love you had in the beginning. In a crowd this size, some of you are two-timing God. You love God and you love the world. You love hanging out with the church people and you love hanging out with sinners. It's a heart problem. You don't love God the way you used to. And in a crowd this size, some of you resent God. You're doing the church thing because you're afraid of going to hell. You're afraid of losing your husband or you're afraid of losing your wife or you're afraid of losing it all. It's a heart problem. You don't love God as you did at first. Now, midway through reading the letter, I imagine the saints in Ephesus thinking to themselves, how did we not see this? How was it possible that a church like Ephesus, how did we allow this to get past us? That was a shocking revelation for Ephesus. The church with high standards failed the greatest standards of all. The love was gone. They had a reputation of a New Testament church, but the spirit of a religious institution surviving on programs and a busy calendar and you know the difference between reform and transform is reform people fall in love with programs. Transform people fall in love with Jesus. 
John is dealing with an internal problem in the congregation. It is direct, it's personal, and it leaves no room for debate. It's a heart thing. Ephesus just got handed their notice for heart surgery. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You are one heartbeat away from revival. One heartbeat away from saving your marriage. One heartbeat away from saving your destiny. One heartbeat away from saving friendships. One heartbeat away from saving yourself from a slow spiritual death. And in a Bible conference setting like this, uh, you are just a heartbeat away from losing it all or taking your Christianity to the next level. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, the smoke and flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Don't turn away God's Spirit. Don't turn your back on God. And verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, I want you to pay attention to the statement, I will come to you quickly, remove your lampstand from its places. Among 61 different translations of the Bible, two common words is lampstand and candlestick. I will remove your lampstand from its place, or I will remove your candlestick from its place. But there is one Bible translation that describes a greater danger. That is the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible reads, I will visit you and remove the church, its impact from its place, unless you repent. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, we didn't get this far to lose the church and its impact. And I'm talking about the decades of sacrificing, the decades of laboring, the decades of discipleship, and the decades of church planting. And we didn't get this far to have the church and its impact removed from its place due to a heart problem. Now that I got your attention... Luke 17, verse, 30, verse 32, remember Lot's wife. One of the shortest verses in the Bible, only three words, but it packs a punch. It's one of those Bible verses that yells out warning. Remember Lot's wife. Genesis 19, verse 17, so it came to pass when they had bought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind nor stay anywhere in the plains. Escape to the mountains. At least you be destroyed. Uh, Genesis 19, verse 26. But his wife looked back behind him. She became a pillar of salt. Uh, Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. It is a memorial as a reminder of rebellion and exposing her secret love for the world. It is an unusual kind of judgment, an internal change from the inside that turns soft tissues into a petrified state, hard as stone in a matter of seconds. Remember Lot's wife. When she turned her back on God's command, she was turning her back on her family. She's turning her back on her husband, leaving behind her daughters to fend for themselves and out of desperation to save the family rights, her daughters commit incest uh, with their own father. You know, they say that when teenage boys go bad, it's bad. But when teenage girls go bad, it's worse than bad. <laughs> and so parents, all you parents out there, when you turn your back on God, it will always have a negative chain reaction on the people closest to you, especially your kids. And so Lot's wife was fossilized in an act of rebellion. In a matter of seconds, quickly, her influence and impact on the family was removed from its place forever. 
And you are always one heartbeat away from obedience and disobedience. You are one heartbeat away from saving it or losing it. One heartbeat away from spiritual revival or spiritual death. It's a heart problem. You can trace it back to when you left your first love. You don't love God like you used to. You don't love God like the beginning. You don't love God like you did at first. The love is gone. I want to talk to you about passive rejection. But before I move on, I want to make a statement right here. Love is the cornerstone in everything that we do for God. To be fully engaged in the work of God requires love. And without a genuine love for God, you lose the excitement and the passion. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 3 and verse 8. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You go down to verse 8. Love never fails. I'll stop right there. Love never fails. Repeat after me. Love never fails. Now say it like you mean it. Love never fails. Verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You know, love is the cornerstone in everything that we do for God. Passive rejection is a pattern of indirectly expressing negative feelings instead of openly expressing how you really feel. There is a disconnect between what a person says and what he or she does. Let me put it to you this way. When the love is gone, you're not in it like you used to be. Though I speak with the tongues of men of angels, but, I, uh, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift, prophecy, and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, have not love, it profits me nothing. And so passive rejection, it reduces you down to just making noise like a symbol. It reduces spiritual gifts invaluable and it reduces volunteering to non-existence. When the love is gone, Passive rejection kicks in. And so you're trying your best to sound like an angel. And you're trying your best to exercise the gifts uh, that you have. And you sign up for the impact team. You sign up uh, for the drama practice. But there is a disconnect between what you're doing and how you feel. Passive rejection is trying not to show your real feelings. You're in it, but you're not in it. You keep looking at your watch. You can't wait till it's over. You're trying your best to disguise rejecting your involvement. Remember Lot's wife. Exposed for having a secret love. It might explain why so many Christians are all over the map today. When they left their first love, the thrill is gone. As the late blues singers B.B. King would say. You know, there is nothing harder than trying to lead people in the kingdom of God that are disengaged, disingenuous, discombobulated, and divorced from the church. Counseling a marriage when the love is gone, that's pretty hard, folks. Have you ever been to a concert scene that's dead? Have you ever been about to an outreach and nobody shows up? 
And I got a revelation a long time ago. It's a heart problem. Their love for God has changed. And now it's interfering with their relationship with God. Their priority changes. Their commitment changes. Their focus is somewhere else. The mission is abandoned. And one by one, you see lampstands missing in action. I had a friend tell me that his studies on research on church history is poor and how he needed to work on it. Well, you know, church history is filled with powerful beginnings. Every great awakening started with passion and zeal. Sadly, uh, their impact has fallen short of reaching the 21st century, uh, from the Methodist Church uh, to the Sunderland Revival, where the Assembly of God and Smith Wigglesworth came out of the Salvation Army, including the hippie revivals in the late 60s and 70s. And we're talking about lampstand removed from its place, churches and impact erased. So I want to talk to you about falling in love with God again. Genesis 29, Jacob meets Rachel. Laban had two daughters. The elder was Leah, the younger was Rachel. Not wanting a relative like Jacob to work for him without paying a wage. They cut a deal, an engagement between Jacob and Rachel for seven years of work. Genesis 29, verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seem only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. We fast forward. There's the wedding day. There's the honeymoon. And Jacob wakes up the following morning. Wrong woman. It was Leah in bed, all smiles. <laughs> Jacob rushes to the boss's office. Says, man, you tricked me. You said seven years for Rachel. Genesis 29, verse 26, And Laban said, It must not be done so in our country, to give the younger before the firstborn. You know, tradition can be a good thing when it comes to food, <laughs> but not when it comes to weddings. And so it's time to renegotiate. Genesis 29, verse 27, fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which, which you will serve with me still another seven years. And so the first seven years seem only if a few days to Jacob because of the love he had for Rachel. And so Jacob served another seven years, and Jacob marries Rachel. His love for Rachel, it is as strong as it was 14 years ago. And listen to me carefully. Your love for God needs to be the sole reason why you're serving him. I'm talking about your love for the Savior. I'm talking about your love for the King. Your first love will make the years seem like only days. Exodus 21, verse 4 to 6, If his master has given him a wife, she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be of her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He also shall bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awe, and he shall serve him forever. That is a, a lifetime statement that if a servant plainly says that I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall take him to the judge, bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. You know, longevity will leave a mark on you. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, the essence of the law, and now Israel, what does the Lord God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And here is the connection. Walk in all his ways and love him. 
1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, let all that you do be done with love. Another revival, yes. Another conference, yes. Another men's discipleship, yes. Another outreach, yes. Because when you're in love, it seems like it was just yesterday. Now, I want to go back to Ephesus. It must have been an incredible service. That morning when John opens the letter, he reads it to his congregation that you have left your first love. I, I didn't say that. Jesus said it. And it must have been a Holy Ghost altar call after his preaching. And my picture, the Apostle John walked to the edge of this uh, stage uh, and if God is speaking to you, raise your hand, and I can see hands going up everywhere. If you've left your first love, uh, raise your hand. I see that hand. God bless you. God is speaking to you. You've left your first love. Uh, uh, raise your hand. I see that hand over there. I see that hand over there. I see that hand over there. God is speaking to you. I'm not going to hold this any longer. God is speaking to you this morning. What a Holy Ghost altar call that might have been. Now, in a setting like this, I wonder how many of you have left your first love. You know, history tells us that Ephesus responded to the rebuke. They got their heart right, then the church was back in revival. According to history, the church in Ephesus planted more churches and missionaries into Asia after they got their heart right with God. John took over a church with a heart problem. They had all the right programs. They had a reputation of high standards, but they failed at the greatest standards of all. That is to love God. And Jesus had a message for Ephesus, repent, then get back to the basics. Listen, get the love back in the church and it will take off again. You are one heartbeat away from revival. One heartbeat away from saving your marriage. One heartbeat away from saving your destiny. One heartbeat away from saving yourself from a slow spiritual death. One heartbeat away from getting back the excitement and the passion for the things of God. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, verse 7, to him who overcomes, I will give him the eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise. Uh, and you know what? Christians on fire for God, they don't need motivational speeches. They create their own speeches. Amen. Uh, light me up, pour gasoline. Uh, a church on fire for God don't need a calendar. The calendar follows the church. The letter written to Ephesus was their lifeline. It rekindled the spirit of revival. It reunited its members. It protected years of influence and impact on its people and its nation. I recently read a study on falling in love, it says a person will fall in love three times during their lifetime. Now for me, salvation fulfilled the study of falling in love three times in my lifetime. I fell in love with Jesus, I'm still in love. Fell in love, in love with Becky, my beautiful wife, still in love. I fell in love with the church, I'm still debating. <laughs> Just joking. Just joking. Come on, man. Come on, man. Just joking. But you know, even with all the stress and the heartaches, even with all the stress and the heartaches, I still love the church. We've come too far to lose everything. We've worked too hard to lose the influence that we gained over the years, the years of labor, the years of agony, fighting like a madman to win every battle. We've come too far as a fellowship to take New Zealand only to lose it because of a heart problem. 
You are a heartbeat away from being all in again. Colossians 3, verse 14. But above all things, uh, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Here's another translation. Love is more important than anything else. It is what ties everything completely together. And I close with this verse. 1 John 4, verse 19. That we love him because he first loved us. Praise God. Let's welcome Pastor Stephanie. to Mark 9. Let's turn to Mark 9. If you have your Bibles, we have a kid's shoe up here. Just <laughs> it's a cool way to start this. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Pastor McGrath, for the opportunity to preach this morning. I believe God is going to speak to us. Mark 9, starting in verse 17. We love hearing stories of, of people that are successful, people that do well, people that achieve great things. And it's very inspiring when you see someone else do well. You're like, man, I want to I be like that. I want to do that. And sometimes we can hear stories of people do well. We can hear uh, how they live their life. And we could start to think that it just became easy for them. We can think that people became successful and it was just a smooth road to the mountaintop. But understand this, is that success is always intertwined with failure. Someone said this failure is not the opposite of success, but it's part of success. It is not the opposite, it's part of it. There's a man by the name of Jack Ma. He had to redo his intermediate exam twice to get into the school he wanted. At college, again, he failed twice in his exam to get through. He applied for university and he wrote letters. He got rejected 10 times in his universities. Some of you are like, yeah, I didn't get rejected at university. I, I never applied. And so... He got rejected 10 times, then he applied for, for jobs, he applied for 30 jobs, didn't get one of those jobs. He got finally got a group interview at KFC, hallelujah, praise the Lord, finally, he's in a group interview. Everyone in the group got the job except for him. Now, if the colonel lets you down, you know you got issues, like, you know what, it's like, <laughs> so he's like, you know what, I'm going to start my own business. He starts up his own business the first year, they don't make any money. The second year, they don't make any money. The third year, they don't make any money. And so he, he applies for funding. His funding gets rejected. And he's like, what, what the heck's going on here? He kept believing. He kept pushing. This man, he started a business. That business name is called Alibaba.com. He is China's richest man worth $45 billion. Because failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. And what do you do, church, when you believe, when you push, you give yourself, you, you step out in faith, you try your best, but you still fail at that time? How do we respond? How do we respond to roadblocks when we're trying to reach the destiny that God has for us? And the simple answer is that we believe again. We are going to believe again. So I'm going to preach a sermon this morning. I've entitled Believe Again out of Mark chapter 9, a famous story that's in three of the Gospels. We'll start reading in verse 17. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seized him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. When they brought him to Jesus and when he saw him, Immediately the, the spirit convulsed him and he fell to the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. 
And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one as dead. So many said, he is dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word and your spirit that is here this morning. I'm praying, God, no matter what we go through, nevertheless, God, let us believe again for great and mighty things. Increase our faith this morning so you can work in us. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody says, amen. Amen. Three points today. Let's look firstly at fragile faith. The background of our text is that Jesus takes his three boys, Peter, James, and John, and they go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And you always think about that. Imagine there's 12 of you guys at church, and a pastor comes, look, we're going to go up and uh, see Moses and Elijah. Yeah, use three. Rest of you nine. No. Do the vacuuming. You know what I mean? It's like the poor, poor Bartholomew, you know, the poor bloke. He's a uh, rejection issues. And so they go up to the mountain. They're seeing Moses. They're seeing Elijah. This is incredible, these mountaintop experiences. And thank God that we can still experience mountaintop experiences. We have them this week at conference, and we love, we feel the faith of God. We feel the power of God. When we have revivals or good outreaches or things go well, we experience this, and it's exciting. We love to be there, but we don't live at the mountaintop. We must come down to the valley. And the reality is most of life is actually in the valley, not on the mountain. Most of your life will be found in the valley, and in our text, when they come from the mountain down to the valley, in the valley there is a demon waiting. And so that teaches us that your path to destiny must go through Demon Valley. It must go through Demon Valley, and that valley of death is after your faith. It's trying to take away your faith, because it's easy to believe God when you see Moses and Elijah. It's very hard to believe God when you see a demon that's not changing. What do I do in this situation? So there's a major difference between being faithless and lacking faith. Faithless is when you're unsaved, you have no faith in God, but you can be saved and lack faith. You can have your heart right with God, but not have your faith at the levels that is required. In Luke 22, Jesus says to Peter, the devil has come to sift you as wheat. He goes, I've come to grind up your life. And he says to him, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. So the lesson is, our faith can fail. There can be times where we don't believe that God can come through. And the devil is after your faith. The word believe means to consider something to be true or worthy of one's trust. In June 30, in 1859, there was a man by the name of Charles Blondin. And he was the first man to walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Niagara Falls, this tightrope he had, it was 48 meters high and 335 meters across. 25,000 people came to watch this incredible event. And so they're watching him and he's going, he's got no harness, he's got no safety net. If he, if he falls, he is dead meat. He walks across very slowly. They're everyone, it's hushed, it's quiet. They're watching him. He finally makes it to the other side and everyone cheers like, I can't believe this guy made it. The story goes that he used stilts and he went across on stilts. Then he went on a wheelbarrow and there was like cheering there. This guy's incredible. And he said, how many of you believe I can put someone in the wheelbarrow and cross the tightrope? And they're like, yeah, we believe. And he said, how many want to jump in the wheelbarrow? And there was silence. And I believe that's many Christians today. You, you agree that God can do the impossible, but you don't believe it for yourself. Yeah, you, we believe, yeah, yeah, God can. God's the God of the impossible. But for my life, I don't know. God can save family members, but just not your family. God can work miracles, just not in your life. God can use fallen people, but you're too fallen. We believe that God can restore marriages, but your husband's the devil. Well, the ladies, no, no, no. And so we have to understand that God can work in anyone, but we must believe for ourselves. Did you know that God is offended with unbelief? For two reasons. Number one, unbelief attacks the personality of God. The word unbelief means to refuse to believe. Unbelief is a failure to respond to God with trust, implying that the unbeliever has had full opportunity of believing, but has rejected it. It describes an unwillingness to commit oneself to another, to respond positively to another's words or actions. When we say, when we don't believe, we are telling God, You can't do that. You can do it for him. You can do it for her, but you can't do it for me. You're not strong enough. You're not wise enough. You're not loving enough. And that offends God. It's attacking his nature. In our text, Jesus gets upset. Look what he says in verse 19. 
says, he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long should I be with you? How long should I bear with you? This word bear means suffer. Why am I suffering because of your unbelief? The parallel text in Matthew, and Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. That gives us a great revelation that unbelief leads to perversion. Unbelief leads to perversion. A.W. Tozer said, unbelief is actually perverted faith, for it puts faith not in a living God, but in dying men. In fact, this word unbelieve or disbelieve or they did not believe, uh, this, this certain word is used six times in the New Testament, and every time that word unbelief is used in the New Testament, those six times, they all account to the resurrection of Jesus. Because once you start uh, uh, having unbelief that God can move in your situation, soon enough, you're not even going to believe that he's alive. That's where it leads. That's why it is per uh, perverted. So number one, it attacks the personality of God. But number two, unbelief attacks the power of God. Unbelief is demonic because it stops God's power. Matthew 13, 58. Now we did not do many works there because of their unbelief. This is, this is such a deep scripture. That Jesus, the Son of God, is restrained from moving because of humans' unbelief. That's very, very deep. In our text, in the NRT, it says, have mercy on us and help us if you can. And Jesus says, what do you mean if I can? I felt like, a, you know, a bit of the Arab coming out there. It's like, what do you mean if I can? And I think God still feels that. What do you mean if I can? You tell me I don't have enough power to do this? And there's people here this morning, maybe your faith has failed. You used to believe for miracles, for salvations, for healing, for revival, that God can use your life, saved your loved ones. All you used to dream about is pioneering, being a missionary. God's going to use you in mighty ways. But now your, your faith has become fragile and it's dropped and now your faith has fell. You don't believe the same way you used to believe. You know, we love new converts' faith, right? They want to do anything. Let's just send it. Let's go. And that's, that's exciting. But then older converts look on and it's like, oh, look at them. They're just, they're just excited. They'll calm down. And we use that as mature faith. No, that's unbelieving. And that's an offense to God. When you look on people that have some excitement, that are believing God for the impossible, but you're because you're mature. You're not mature. That is unbelieving. And I, I wish I'd still have a new convert faith with me all the time and believe for incredible things and not live off experience. So that's fragile faith. So let's look secondly at failing faith. How does our faith fail? Well, I believe through four main reasons found in our text. Number one, our faith can fail through personal issues. Our text is very deep. Look at verse 17. Then one in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth. In Luke's gospel, it says, Teacher, I implore you, look at my son, for he is my only child. Can you hear the heartbreak of this father? This is my son. This is not, I'm just hoping someone gets saved on the weekend. This is a deep personal issue. He's not a random person. This is not a friend. This is his son, his only son. Can you imagine when they were rejoicing when he found out that his wife was pregnant? They find out they have a boy, they're excited, and they're, they're just rejoicing what God's going to do. They have plans for the boy. They believe in God to do great things. But then the seizures start coming. And in our text, there's, there's no account of the wife. I'm not sure if the wife's around. And he has a deep personal issue. And there's people here today, you have a personal issue. There's something personal in your life that maybe no one else knows about. It. Maybe you come to conference and on the outs, outward, you're, you're full of faith. Everyone's like, it looks good. But on the inside, there's some, there's some wounds and on your heart. There's some personal things that are vexing your soul. Could be in your home or in your heart or in your health. There might be a son who's gone astray, a child sick, a betrayal. And our personal issues can cause our faith to fail. So number one, personal issues. Number two could be our personnel issues. Verse 17, it says, and the one in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son, so I spoke to your disciples, and they could not cast it out, uh, for them to cast it out, but they could not. Now, the father's a good man. He, he's coming to the disciples for healing. He has a sick son. He does what he could. Maybe he got a flyer of a revival saying, we're going to pray for the sick. 
and he believed and he brings his son up and he goes up to the prayer line and everyone's getting healed and then he gets to his son, they pray and his son doesn't get healed. And he looks, how, how come my son didn't get healed? How come your disciples pray for that person? They got healed, how come it didn't happen for me? And look how he speaks. He says, Jesus, I brought you my son, but they couldn't cast it out. You know what, church? Sometimes Christians can let us down and we take that out on God. God, you didn't come through because someone hurt me. Someone who's a believer who represents the church has hurt me, so therefore I'm going to turn against God. You did this to me. God, why did you let this happen to me? When it wasn't God, it was them. You're telling me Jesus didn't have enough power? It was the disciples that didn't have enough power. And we can have that. Listen, in church, we are going to get offended from people. Listen, if, if your pastor hasn't offended you yet, it's coming. It's going to happen. But some people, hey, the pastor did something wrong, therefore I, I backslide, I've got my victim card out. Like, really? That person didn't follow up on me. Oh, I, I hate hearing this. They used to invite me over for dinner. They don't invite me over for dinner anymore. Invite yourself over for dinner. You invite them. But we can get upset at someone, and then we take that out on God. And God's like, I didn't do anything. That's like someone cutting you off at, on, on the road, and then you take it out on your wife at home. And God's like, what are you doing? But we've done this. And people leave God because of other people all the time. All the time. Church split because of this. People go to hell because of this. Because of someone, they turn against God. The third reason our faith can fail is perplexing issues. Our text, the son has a, has a mute spirit, but then Jesus actually calls it a deaf and dumb spirit. And the reality is, it's not the physical things that's happening, it's actually the spiritual thing. Life is far more spiritual than we realize. We think if I had a better pastor, a better spouse, a better Bible study leader, a better whatever it is, and then life will get better. No, our problems aren't physical, they are spiritual. Have you ever thought, why am I going through this? Why is this happening? This doesn't make sense. And there's times we're so physically minded that we're trying to put all the, the blocks together and I, I did A, B, C and I, I didn't get D or E, I actually got an F and an L. I did what pastor told me to do. I did the right thing and look what happens. In our text, he has, he has seizures. He can't control this. He jumps into the fire. He jumps into the water. He can't control it. Church, we're going to have countless problems in life that you have no control over. And if, you're, if you want to control every situation in life, we're not going to be able to. Why do people betray us? I don't know. Why did that person break your heart? I don't know. You were kind, you were loving, you were sacrificial, and then they turn around, there's no love in the church. It's like, bro, do you know what I, what I get? Are you serious? We can't change people. I've tried. You can't. You just know what, exactly what I'm talking about. I've, I preached it, I said it, I prayed it. I've, they have to get it for themselves. And some things, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. You know, think, about, think about Joseph, right? Everyone's going to bow down to you. This is going to be incredible. Yeah, and then he's in prison. And he's a slave. Then he gets out of prison, gets accused of rape, back into prison. Then he helps other people get out of prison, and they forget about him. What the heck? How does that work? How many years was he in prison for? Years and years and years and years for something he never did. That's perplexing. And that can cause us to quit on God. There was one time in my ministry, this was actually recently, I think it was last year, I had like these serious demons of insecurity. And if you've ever felt these demons before, you know what I'm talking, these are deep demons. And I was just getting attacked in my mind. You, you are not a good pastor for this church. You are not leading them correctly. Because of you, they're going to suffer. And like this, this, was, this was messing me up hard. I couldn't explain it, but I, I felt it, and I felt it was real. So I called Pastor Elliot. He was my pastor at the time. I said, Pastor, I'm feeling serious insecurity. Like, I don't feel like I'm cut out for this. I'm feeling this. And he says, Dan, you, you do know we're in a battle, right? I was like, that's the one. One phone call to realize that life is more spiritual than we realize. 
So it's perplexing issues. The fourth reason our, our faith fails is because of patience issues. Verse 21, he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. This is deep pain. Because if from childhood, that means he's not a child anymore. So it could be 20, 30, 40, 50. Year after year. How many times do you reckon this guy prayed and kneeled on his bed and said, God, will you please heal my son? How many years? How many times did he cry for his son? He's probably got burn marks on his arm because he has to rescue his son from the fire. And I'm just sick of dealing with this issue. Have you ever gone through a problem that's like, God, how many times am I going to pray for this? God, how many times do I have to ask for this? God, when are you going to come through for me? And you're going through the same problem again and again and again and again. And start, we start to think, well, my faith doesn't make a difference anymore, so it might as, I might as well not believe. And we feel like quitting. David struggled with this in Psalm 13, verse 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now, we don't say that out loud. But in our mind, it's like, God, come on. Like, how, how long? Like, when you, come on, God. How long will you hide your face from me? Have you ever felt like you just can't get God's attention? How long should I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? And maybe you're going through a problem. It's just been a little bit too long. And you've stopped believing God. In our text, he says in verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion. NLT says, have mercy on us if you can. And we can start to pray those types of prayers to God. God, if you can, can you just come through? If you can. That's not a faith prayer. And can also add, God, if it's your will, just let it happen. That's not a faith prayer either. Because God's will doesn't just happen. God is willing that none should perish. God's will doesn't just happen. It's faith. And there's times we can just be like, you know what, I'm just... You used to say God can. But now you say, God, if you can. You used to really believe those things. It used to be in your mouth. It used to be in your heart, in your mind. But now it's, if, if, if God can maybe come through. If you can, help me. And when you go through these four stages of, of failing faith, you can start to become really cynical, like what Pastor Salanol was preaching about. And so, you, oh, another outreach, man. Like, what's the point of going on outreach if we went last time to the same place and no one got saved? Tell me, I'm the only one that thought that? What's the point of going on this impact team, spending all this money and not sleeping, doing all of this and nothing happens? Or we can start getting angry at God or bitter towards God. Some people even backslide and fall into sin, make bad decisions. It's very easy to turn cynical when our faith fails. 2019 wasn't the greatest year for me. Like, I've had good and bad years. Let's pretend 2019 just didn't happen. And, um, like, we were just, I just, the church was just getting smashed. I did a whole series on, on battle stations, on spiritual warfare. We did the whole series, and then no one applied anything I thought. And it just went, <laughs> like, it was just, it was very bad. It was very bad. People, guys were, some of my leaders were backsliding, like unusual injuries they were getting. Stupid rugby, stupid rugby, <laughs> stupid rugby. <laughs> but like I say, guys that I've invested my life into for years, and they were like sons to me, and they backslid. That's very hard to handle. And then, I'm just being honest with you, I became pretty cynical. Because one Sunday morning, these, these two young boys got saved. I don't know how old they were, 17, 18, 19. And I wasn't even happy. Because what am I going to do? Am I going to pour out another three, four years into you and you're going to do the same thing? Is it, is it, really, do I have to go through this again? Because you know, when you're making a disciple, when they get saved, cool, that's, that's the easy part. I'm not going to have to deal with it. I have to invest all of this and get rejected again. Is there something you've just stopped believing God for? Well, you don't believe as much as you did. God, if you can. God, please, if you're free. If you have some spare power. <laughs> we, we've stopped believing. Some of you, you're scared to mention your prayers out loud just so you don't get disappointed. 
You don't want to tell people what you're praying for because what if it doesn't happen? Then you look bad. We've all been there, right? Busy and Angie in our church, they're having trouble having children, but every time we had a prayer night, he said, we were praying we wouldn't have a child for years. And then baby Sky came because he didn't let patience issues deter his faith. And then we can, we can say, God, I, I believe, Lord, but just help my unbelief. Believing for the first time is easy, right? But the second, third, fourth, and fifth is very difficult. So let's close with fervent faith. How do we get our faith back with fire? Jude 22 says, you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. I'm not here to condemn tonight. The hope is, is that you can get your faith back. You can get back to that same place with vengeance. I read an article that says a hiker lost in the U.S. mountain of Mount Albert for 24 hours ignored repeated calls from his rescuers because he didn't recognize the number. The dude's stinking lost. They're calling him. He doesn't recognize the number, so he doesn't answer the phone. And he spends the night out. This guy's just insane. Listen, if you've lost your faith, you need to answer the call when God comes calling. And he might not call you the same way that he did before, but you must be ready to answer wherever he calls. You have a part to play. In our text, again, Jesus gets a bit offended, but then he offers hope. Verse 22, the spirit often throws him into the fire and into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can, Jesus said. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Listen, God's power is either restrained or released by your faith. It's like a tap. All the water in that tap is available, but you need to turn the tap on. Don't look at the tap. There's no water there. Look at it. I told you nothing's going to work. You have a part to play. Your faith turns on the power of God. This is how God works. Yes. He says, all things are possible if you can do this. All things. Not some things. Not most things. Not little things. All things are possible if you and I can believe. Doesn't that make sense why the devil attacks your faith so much? Pastor Greg has said, God has made it that those who have faith have everything and those who don't have faith have nothing. And the devil wants you to have nothing. So he's going to attack your faith because he knows with no faith, there is no power. Charles Spurgeon said this, God is always true. Why do we not believe him? He is always faithful to his word. Why can we not trust him? We, when we are in a right state of heart, faith costs no effort. It is then as natural for us to rely upon God as a child to trust its father. The worst of it is that we can believe God about everything except the present pressing trial. This is foolishness. Come, my soul, shake off such sinfulness and trust thy God with the load, the labor, and the longing of this present trial. This done, all is done. If you could get your faith right, everything else will sort itself out. This done, all is done. So how do we get our faith back? Five things. Number one, be desperate. In our text, it says, immediately the father cried out and said with tears. This is some serious approach to God. He's not saying, God, like, can you just help me with my faith? He's crying out. When was the last time we really got on our knees before God and said, God, I need you to move in this situation? Desperate. Serious desperation. When I was outreach director in Footscray, Pastor Elliot would always tell me, Dan, you need to increase your faith. I said, yes, Pastor. Then I'd go home. I was like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> increase your faith. Okay. I had no idea. And because I didn't ask the question, so for years I didn't know. <laughs> it was, you know, the concert scene wasn't going as great as we wanted. And I was, I was doing old course and people weren't getting saved and I was getting frustrated. And, you know, one time there was no visitors. You know those concerts, no visitors? And you know, like, uh, what am I going to say? You know. And so I walked outside. I'm not sure if Pastor Elliot, he doesn't know this story. I walked outside, and it was raining. I just stood in the rain. <laughs> Crying. It's just, it's just falling down. I was like, oh, well, the concert's dark. They can't see what I look like anyway. Man, and I was just like, God, please, just do something. But the challenge to increase my faith was some personal devotion to God. I started doing some fasting. And my mentality wasn't, I hope this works on the weekend. My mentality was, this is going to stink and work. And doesn't matter what happens, we will have dominion and authority and people will be saved. And things started to change from that time forward. Increased faith says, today is the day God is going to move. Not he might move today. No, he will move today. 
God is going to work in powerful ways. Not just going through the motions, but a deep passion. So number one, it's desperation. Number two, it's through drawing near. Jesus said, bring him to me. He was close to the disciples, but he needed to get close to Jesus. We understand the Bible says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. How do we draw near to God? Well, it's through prayer and holiness. Personal fasting, dedication to the Lord. Draw near to God in the secret place and you will have great faith in the public arena. Number three is that you need to decide. You need to choose to believe again. Now, I know that sounds simple, but look what Jesus said to Thomas when he was doubting the resurrection in John 20, 27. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. No, isn't that deep. I know you don't believe this. Just believe it. Make a decision. You have a choice whether you believe or not. I just can't believe. Yes, you can. If Jesus said to Thomas, stop being unbelieving, believe. Some of it, you just need to stop being unbelieving and negative, depressing the devil, and just start being positive. And believe God and expect God to do great things. Regardless of what I see, regardless of what happens, I choose to believe God is going to work on my behalf. Can I say, if those in leadership, in any capacity, you must get this right to choose to believe, because the higher you go in leadership, the more opportunity people have to hurt you. I want to be a leader. Okay, enjoy it. Right? We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Every pastor knows what I'm talking about. But look what it says. The scripture Pastor Salanoa used, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. And you need to say, that really hurt. But I choose to love and believe again. I believe God's going to get through this. I believe the next, this, that person may have let me down. That person may have backslid. That person may have betrayed me. But this next person, I believe God's going to work through them. I believe again. I choose to believe can, I no, can we notice here that the boy had no faith? This sick boy had no faith. Demon-possessed boy had no faith. Yet the father had faith. And because of the father's faith, the boy was healed. Now this is deep because that shows that your faith can heal other people, not just yourself. And I believe this is where the gift of faith comes, to, come, comes into play. Every time I go and preach a revival, I say, God, give me the gift of faith this week so my faith has enough faith to overcome all the unbelief in the building. And you, need, you can have that. If you're a leader here, you should have enough faith that it should heal the people that follow you. That you believe, regardless of what they believe, you can change the atmosphere. Choose to believe again and you could heal your brothers and sisters. Number four is you need to depend. In our text, the Father cries out to Jesus. And I understand we should call, on, call out, out to God and pray. But when was the last time you just asked your brothers or some pastors for help? When was the last time you depended on someone else? There's some people, I can do it by myself. Well, I can't. You must be very, very strong. I can't do it by myself. I'd call Pastor Elliot all the time. I'd call him even when I had nothing to talk about. I just, I just want to talk because I understood my relationship with him brought me great faith. Talking with, with other pastors, other friends, just speak. When I'm struggling, I can speak to them and they can encourage my faith. Some of you, you, you struggle in your faith and then you don't tell anyone about it. Let's get, can we just get over our insecurity issues and just reach out for help so we can help each other? We're a fellowship and we're stronger together. It's not just about one person. It is all of us together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And finally, we need to be determined. Whatever happens, keep believing. Believe again. Verse 26. And the Spirit cried out. He takes him to Jesus. The Spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly, and he came out of him. And he became as one dead, and many said, he is dead. Well, that's just great. Your, your, <laughs> your disciples didn't heal him. I brought him to Jesus. Jesus killed him. Ever prayed for something? I believe. And then it got worse. What the heck just happened? And then Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Your problem might get worse before it gets better. But be determined to not give up because even when your situation looks dead, God can still bring resurrection power and resurrection life. Despite demonic assaults, believe again. All things are possible to those who believe. Can you believe again? We know the story, our Pastor Mitchell one of the greatest disciple makers in the whole world. If you ever went to his healing crusades, it was incredible. There was like a tangible presence on the stage. I got to go on a couple of them. And you felt the power of God on the stage. And he tells the story that earlier in his ministry, he prayed for the sick. They didn't get healed. And for six years, he didn't pray for the sick. But he decided to believe again and healing crusades all around the world. And he says, I don't have the gift of healing. I just believe God can do that. He chose to believe again and you choose to believe again, God could do miracles in your life. Before Pastor Elliot came to Footscray, the thinking was 
you, you know, go out, be a pioneer, see what happens. If it doesn't work out, just come back. I was talking to Pastor Elliot about that, and he was like, he was offended with me. He's like, what, what stinking ridiculous thing are you saying, Dad? He says, you need to go out and say, the kingdom of God is here because I'm here, and I will be successful. That changed my whole mentality. I came here to New Zealand. It's like, there is a stinking new sheriff in town. We're taking this land. This is ours, right? You need to have that mentality. I'm taking over. God is with me. I'm here. God is with me. God's going to move on my behalf. In your work, wherever you are. Pastor last night was talking about uh, uh, backsliders getting dreams. I, I, I've been praying that for years. And on Sunday, we had this backslider come. I said, oh, how come, how come you came out? She got saved that night. And she says, well, last night I had a dream that I was drinking. And then I somehow bumped into you. What a great dream. And she freaked out. And then apparently I gave her a growling, whatever. And then um, the, her, her dream ends with her getting saved at the altar. She wakes up. She's like, I need to get saved. She came on Sunday night. She got saved. Praise God. There's times you don't think anything's happening. This backside, she's been backsliding for years. But God is moving. If you keep believing, God can move on our behalf. 2019 was definitely the year of hell, but 2020 was the year from heaven. God came through in 2020. Through the lockdowns, God moved in incredible ways. Like, it will blow my mind. I'm still hearing stories. I heard a story today, that, uh, yesterday. One of the ladies here from, from Liverpool, she got saved in one of our live streams during that time and then looked up a church and went to the Liverpool church. But we got a lot of people saved at that time. But more than just getting people saved, seven of the men who got saved at the end of 2019, the start of 2020, and through the lockdown. We have, we have six Bible studies and six assistants, 12 men. Seven of those men got saved at the end of 2019, start of 2020. What I thought that this was a horrible year, God flipped it around and brought great leaders in our church. In 2020, we sent out our first church. God did incredible things because we decided to believe again. If you could believe again, God could do powerful things in your life. I'm gonna do one thing before we close. There's people here, I know we've got old school later on, but there's people here, you've stopped believing for something. As I was preaching, you felt something. There's something I used to believe but I'm lacking. It could be a salvation of someone. It could be God using your life. It could be a, a whole stack of revival, disciple, a, a whole stack of things. But you want to believe again. I want to lead you through a prayer. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet right now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to believe God to help us. Stand up real quickly. You're going to believe again. There's an area that you've stopped believing, but you're going to believe again, and God is going to move on your behalf. And we're going to see God move in miraculous ways. I want you to raise your hands to heaven, and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I want you to say, Father in heaven, I choose to believe again. Help my unbelief. Forgive me for limiting you. I believe I will have dominion in my mind. My family will be saved. I will make disciples. New Zealand will experience revival. I will enter destiny. Backsliders will return. Miracle money will flow. I will see signs and wonders. The sick will be healed. Demons will be cast out. The demonic will not prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I will trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. All things are possible to those who believe and I choose to believe in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise together, church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What an incredible morning of ministry. Can you say amen? Well, it's time for the break. Amen. Uh, the, the veil has torn and we're about to enter in through the Holy of Holies there. Uh, right all the way through. Uh, I do remind you, uh, the nursery is at the back there. Your children are having the time of their lives. They don't want to see you. There's guards at the door that won't let you in. Do not go to the nursery, please. Peace is at stake. Hallelujah. Uh, donuts uh, is through uh, the doors there. There's no food in the sanctuary here, so eat out there. Eat out further uh, through the doors. Please follow the usher's instructions. Uh, as you may know, through those doors, there is a lake. 
This is not the time to figure out whether you can swim or not. Uh, watch your kids, please. Uh, there is a lake. Uh, their pastors can g- keep going straight all the way through. And Pastor Dan did mention uh, that there is a shoe here. Hallelujah. If your kid is limping, uh, he has only one shoe on. Amen. Uh, come and grab that. That'll be uh, at the media desk right there. We're going to pray. Uh, ask God to help us. And I'm going to get Pastor Brent Underwood to pray for us. Amen.
for this nation to share a dream for this land. We join with angels, we join with angels in celebration. By faith we speak revival to this land where every knee, where every knee shall bow and worship you. Every time confess that you are Lord, if you are the Lord, give us an open heaven and anoint our praises there and move your sovereign hand. Amen. Let's sing it from the top. We have a vision. We have a vision for this nation. We share a dream. For this land, we join with angels in celebration. By faith we speak revival to this land. Where every knee, where every knee shall bow and worship. Sing it again. Where every knee, where every knee shall bow and worship you, and every tongue confess that you are Lord. That you are Lord. Give us an open heaven and anoint our prayers this day. Amen. Let's sing it one more time. Where every knee shall bow. Amen. Let's give him praise here this morning. Hallelujah. Let's lift up the name of Jesus in this place. My God, we glorify you. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, my God, you are worthy. You are worthy of praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated here this morning. We have had a fantastic a morning of ministry. Hallelujah. I hope you're feeling refreshed. Uh, back for another power punching sermon here this morning. Uh, let's welcome Pastor Elliot to come to take the stage. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you. Praise God. It's great to be here. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. You know, um, I preached on resisting the Holy Spirit uh, last night, and I believe uh, God helped us. And so Pastor Dan Stephan said, uh, you preached on uh, some of the tough sermons, you were the bad cop, and this morning I was the good cop. That's what he said, you know, and uh, I'm gonna continue to be the bad cop this morning. <laughs> so I wanna preach the uh, true story of incredible deception. The true story of incredible deception from uh, Acts 5, 1 through 4. Just going to read those couple of verses. You know, there um, in uh, September 11th, 2001, many of us know the tragedy of the terrorist attack in New York City and in America and the, the wickedness of those uh, terrorists who hijacked planes and, and flew them into uh, those twin towers. There's a woman named Tanya Head. She said that she was in the South Tower of the World Trade Center on the 78th floor when the second plane hit. She said she saw the plane so close she could feel the air sucked out of her lungs. When the plane plunged into the 78th floor, by some miracle she survived the impact. 
but her body was burnt by the explosion of the flames. Her left arm was basically severed, hanging by a thread. She was thrown across the room and passed out. Waking up, she crawled through the carnage, she said. Her life was on the line. She was handed a wedding ring by a man who would never make it down and he asked her to take it to his wife. Eventually, she spotted a man with a red bandana, Wells Carruthers, who later became a hero of the 9-11 attacks, giving up his life to lead 12 others to safety. She said, he stretched out his hand and helped me to safety, only to disappear back into the plume of smoke. She made it down the 78th flights of stairs just in time. When the tower collapsed around her, she was thrown under a truck. Six days later, she said, I woke up in hospital burns unit, a Jane Doe only to later discover that her husband Dave had been killed in the other tower, the North Tower. It was a tale of devastation, loss, but of ultimate survival. Tanya Head later became a driving force and a foundation member of the World Trade Center Survivors Network. It was her story that gripped many Americans and those around the world. It was her story that the tour guides, would they would go around when they're touring people in ground zero and telling her story. She would tell her story along with the New York, New York uh, City Mayor, Michael Bloomberg, as they toured. The only problem, it was all a lie. She wasn't even in the country at the time. The whole story was a fabrication. There's actually been a new book uh, written about that entitled The Woman Who Wasn't There. <laughs> the true story of incredible deception. Let's have a look now at Acts 5 verse 1. Let's have a look what it says. This is a true story of incredible deception in Scripture. The Bible says in verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife sold a possession. He kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said to Ananias, why, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? You just need to underline those words. To the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men but to God. I want to have a look at a true story of incredible deception and let's ponder first of all an evil element, an evil element. Because the platform we want to lay here, we as Christians serve her God who cannot and does not lie. Who cannot and does not lie. Our belief system and faith is based on that foundation. This is critical that we serve the God of truth. The God of truth. I'm sharing with Pastor Jade and I so appreciated again the, the presentation by the Hamilton Church uh, last night. And I do remember when I first asked Pastor McGrath we could do some drama reenactment of the gospel coming here. Because the truth is our culture and atheists and ungodly people distort history, hide history, and, and literally turn something that is a powerful truth into a lie. Yes. To rob a next generation of some powerful things for us to be proud of. And as the uh, gospel came to this great nation. See, in Titus 1 verse 2, I mean, the Bible says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time 
begun. See, even the whole essence of eternal life is based on the God of truth telling us there is heaven and hell. He cannot lie. Christ, a man, the embodiment of God, he cannot lie. Hebrews 6 verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Listen, impossible for God to lie. We might find strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay a hold of the hope that is set before us. Our forefathers and those in the faith that have gone before us. The story last night of Stephen, who was an early martyr or the first Christian martyr, why were they willing to give up their life? Because God, who cannot lie, said that this life is not all there is. The God who cannot lie. The Bible says it's impossible. It simply cannot happen. It goes against God's very essence and nature. We know in John 14 verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, there is a principle in faith and religion that you take on the attributes of the gods you serve and worship. No doubt we see that play out, that those that in the Old Testament or even you know, in the New Testament time, those that would worship the Baals and the Ashtaroths, fertility gods, were sexually immoral. Those that you know, honoured and served Bacchus, the god of drinking and wine and drunkenness, got drunk! Right? You take on the attributes of the gods that you serve or worship or the idols in your life. And how many know as Christians, we need to take on the attributes of our God? The Bible says in Proverbs 14 verse 5, a faithful witness does not lie. So that brings us back to our text. I've laid that foundation. Now let's have a look at our text. Verse 3, and Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Another version says, an English revised version, Ananias, why did you let Satan fill your mind with such an idea? Why? Why? How many know it's a very good question? It's a very pointed question. Why have, or why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart and mind to lie? He's asking, because you know, some people say, well, the devil made me do it. Sometimes even your children, mum, the devil made me do it. <laughs> But that's not what we see in our text. Because he asked, why did you allow, you allow, you allow, why did you allow Satan to fill your heart and mind with that very idea to lie? Right? And so, Peter's questioning Ananias' behavior. Peter is used by God to do that. How many know God has done that from the very beginning when man has fallen into sin? We understand the firstborn Cain. He rose up in jealousy, uh, envy uh, against his brother Abel and his relationship with God, a persecution. You know, how many know, as I said last night, carnal people that have lost their relationship with God begin to persecute the righteous. Happens from day one, doesn't it? He rose up, killed his brother. But anyway, God comes to him and, and, and asks Cain, Cain, where is your brother? God knows where he is. But he's wanting Cain to what? Tell the truth. 
He's wanting him to tell the truth, isn't he? He's wanting him to own up and tell the truth. He's giving him an opportunity to be truthful even in the midst of his failure and sin. God's giving him that opportunity. I wonder, you want to pause this, you know, is a great thought. If Cain would have fessed up and been honest, how would have things been different for him? I think it would have been different than being a vagabond and being a wanderer and being isolated from the presence of God and man and having a certain mark and a stain upon him, amen, in his generations. That's a tragic story. So in our text, in the very context of where we're at in the book of Acts, we see the resurrections occurred. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost has come. The end of Acts chapter 2, a great influx into the church. Acts 4, another influx into the church. They're experiencing powerful growth. There's an amazing sense of brotherhood in spite of persecution. A believer named Barnabas has been impacted by the gospel. Uh, and uh, because there's a great need in the early church, the growth is so uh, powerful, exponential. Uh, I mean, there's needs, part of the persecution of the Jewish religion, those that came to Christ, many of them lost their jobs or their uh, places in the family, written out of wills, uh, many times even thrown out of homes. So in some degree, the church had a little bit of a communal setting. They were forced to. And there was money needed to uh, furnish all that God was doing. So a good man came, sold a block of land, and came and gave the money, pledged it in a pledge, gave the money, brought it in. Hallelujah. We know it's good to honour our pledges. I asked our accountant, Charles, and I said, Charles, how do we go at conference? We have conference pledges in the Perth conference. How have we gone? And the good news is, you know, he's charting the money's coming in, gives me a percentage. Oh, well, look, 85%'s come in, 90%'s come in, 90 such and such. I asked him just on Sunday, he said, 108%'s come in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but isn't that good? That's a powerful thing. Amen. So this is what's going on here. Amen. And when Barnabas gives, he's honoured in the church. And the Bible marks it down. You know, there's honour given. He's, he's doing this. Uh, so we, we see this plays out. So Ananias and Sapphira, a couple in the early church, see this. They then decide to jump on board. You know, they uh, would like to have the same perhaps recognition and profile that maybe Barnabas was given. They've seen this as uh, uh, something in the church uh, and they make a pledge and then they come but they conspire amongst each other to keep back portions for themselves. Ananias comes in, Peter asks him these questions and then Peter, how many know Pastor that's in touch with God, has a spiritual inclination, a spiritual edge. He knows things, whether he knows them by knowing them or by the Holy Spirit there. And so anyway, Peter, Peter actually says, while it remained, was it not your own? After it sold, was it not in your own control? Then why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. So what is the, what is the, what is the challenge here? Powerful growth. Yes, some persecution. But again, another, another wave of powerful growth in the early book of Acts. Now we come here. So outside persecution, this is now an internal, I could say, challenge or assault. The church that is founded on truth and the God of truth is now sought to be usurped 
by deception and lies. That's what's going on here. In the very early days here, and you could say, well, pastor, what is the appeal of lying? What is the appeal of lying? You know, there was a man in Australia a number of years ago, I think it was probably maybe 10 years, he's based in Adelaide, and uh, he was a part of that same church group that we mentioned last night. That after conference they go out and drink and go into wrong people's motel rooms. <laughs> he was part of that group. He was a singer and a pastor in that group. And he was singing all about his journey with cancer. He would even get up on stage and sometimes he'd have an oxygen tank there and he'd, you know, and he's doing all this stuff. And then he's singing and he's, you know, people are moved by his cancer story and, you know, he, him endeavouring to believe and overcome and, you know, people are enraptured by that. The only problem is, it's all a lie. He never had cancer. The whole thing's made up. Guglimichi. I think his name was, Michael Guglielmici. It's all a lie. He's made it all up. So there has to be from Cain, I don't know where my brother, am I my brother's keeper, to Guglielmici. <laughs> He's obviously not, not uh, Kiwi or Pacific Islander, can you say amen? <laughs> What's the appeal? In our text, they feel that there's an advantage in lying to gain maybe approval, financial gain, promoting of self-worth perhaps, Cain to cover up. Do you lie to cover up? Others, after a while, lie so much they lie by reflex. It's not even an active decision, I'm going to make up a story. They just do it. They lie by reflex even when there's not a good reason to lie. They call them pathological liars. Some of them are doing it consciously. They're con men. That's where you get con men from. Conscious pathological lies. And some are unconscious. Amen. And because they sang their strong unmet needs, perhaps even in their childhood development, neglect, abuse, leading to ongoing drive to seek forms of care and affection from men, even in self-destructive, manipulative ways, like Tanya Head in our opening story. Many of the churches have done a, an adult Bible hour series on roots of rejection. And it's very powerful when you ponder some of these things. And these are some deep motivations why people lie. Well, look then, secondly, at the deceptive dimension. Deceptive dimension. What you say, what, I, what, what we say begins to be heard by our own ears. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But also what you speak comes back and you hear what you speak and then what you hear begins to sink down into your heart and spirit. So what I mean by that is your words do impact you. They impact other people, but they, what you say impacts yourself. See, there was a guy, uh, there is a, a man who's, in the Perth church and I loved his story. He said before I got saved, he'd come from a country, Victoria, you know, then I think he'd moved somewhat to Melbourne, then he moved to Perth. Anyway, he said, before I got saved, I had a dream to own a certain type of motorcycle. He, he, he dreamed that he wanted to have a Triumph motorcycle. He'd had some motorcycles, but he always said, I wanted to have a Triumph motorcycle, but as that went on as he's a young man growing up, he started telling the story that he had a Triumph motorcycle. 
Not that he wanted one, but he actually had one. And so he's just, you know, dropping, you know, I had a you know, triumph and he's describing the triumph and all that stuff. And so this was before he got saved. So he gets, comes to Perth, gets saved. He's part of the Perth Potter's House Church. And, you know, he's sharing his testimony. And, you know, for the first X amount of uh, months or perhaps I think it was even years, he's telling the story of his triumph motorcycle. He said he had a revelation moment one time that he's telling, he goes, hang on. It's not true. I've never had one. Because he said it so much that he's got now a mental picture and words of, you know, it become his reality in his mind and he realised, I'm living in deception. It's not even true. I've never owned a Triumph motorcycle. As we know, Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So studies show how we align our emotions and response behind what we say and what we hear. Words we say enter our belief structure. What we believe. And in our text, we go back to our text in Acts 5, we see Barnes Notes, a Christian commentator said, their lie was an attempt to deceive and deception to keep back part of the price while he pretended to bring the whole of it, thus tempting God and supposing that God and the church could not detect his fraud. So we're talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago in Scripture. However, is it closer to home than that for us, for you? The truth is, this dimension is a part of man's fallen nature. that we've taken, I would say, all of mankind in their fallen nature and sin nature from our spiritual father or our fallen DNA. The Bible says in John 8, 44, Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. Desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does, does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Another version said, when the devil lies, he's doing what comes naturally to him. He is a liar and the father of lies. So for the devil and his crowd, when they lie... They just do what comes natural. It's their native language. And there's a deceptive dimension here. Pathological liars refer to someone who's lied so frequently becomes a part of who they are and what they believe. They could instantly come up with something plausible explanation or divert a line of questioning. Notice it came out when Peter was questioning. Brings questions. But people have to be careful because there's a dangerous dimension because you could start to feel that your lies are true. See, this morning, I'm wanting to speak against this on, a, you know, on our morning seminar to stigmatize it, to warn of the dangerous dimensions and to let us know that God puts liars under the sentence of judgment. Revelation 21 verse 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving... 
the abominable, murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, listen, and all liars have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, you're wondering, you know, because we think, well, you know, sure, the murderers, the immoral, you know, the sorcerers, which has it, the drug users, the idolaters, those that put things ahead of God and, you know, uh, all those things. But then he says, but all liars? In our text, verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last, so great fear come upon all those that heard. Verse 9, then his wife came in. So Ananias came in herself, so she must have been in a different car when she came to church. <laughs> he came. He's there early. Peter comes and asks him, can I have a word? Yeah, you know, uh, that, uh, talks about that. And uh, you've not lied to God, you've lied, uh, not to man, but you've lied to God. And bang, <laughs> phew, he's dead. The ushers come. powerful <laughs> she comes maybe she comes with the kids she comes in the second vehicle puts the kids in nursery comes up Peter then asked her did you sell the land for such and such oh yeah 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 absolutely and so he says in verse 9 then Peter said to her, how is it you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door and they will carry you out. Pastor Love. <laughs> Do you know, there wasn't a lot of chicken eaten at the chicken dinner after church that day. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Donut break was a little bit quiet. <laughs> is, is, there a, is there a moral there? Godly wife, if your husband's been foolish, you don't have to follow him in foolishness, rebellion and lies. And vice versa. Notice God gave them both an opportunity. Can you say amen? Yeah. Don't hitch your wagon to someone who's gone off the cliff in sin and rebellion. Well, look then finally, are you going to finish good past? I hope so, amen. <laughs> <laughs> the rewarding reality. Listen, can I make a statement? And look, every parent should say this to their children as they're growing up. If you mess up, fess up. Isn't that the lesson even from Cain? Well, even before that, with Adam and Eve themselves. Why are you hiding? Uh, you know, we were naked. Um, <laughs> how come you know you're naked? Like I said, some people believe they were clothed with the glory of God. Something beautiful emanating, but when they sin, they lost something. You do. And then God's given them opportunity, but then they go into the blame game. It's the, it's the woman. And then she says, oh, it's the serpent. And it's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? If we fess up, mess up, fess up. You know, there's, there's a brother that uh, we love in the uh, Melbourne church named Gavin. And Gavin says when he was a young man, he's living in Newcastle, him and his brother, uh, his brother's uh, Pastor Spruce's dad. So anyway, they were unsaved and they were growing, uh, you know, dope plants and, you know, a bit of selling dope and all this stuff out of their house. Anyway, someone reported them. Neighbour looking over, where are you? <laughs> How come I'm not getting any of that? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, the police come knocking on the door. Police come knocking. I think uh, Darren was there and, you know, he might have given some story. I think he, I don't know if he told the truth or not, <laughs> Caleb. But anyway, he tells some story. And then Gavin wasn't there. He'd come back later. Police are there. Anyway, they speak to him. 
and they ask him about the situation. And uh, it's interesting, Gavin just fessed up. So look, you know, yes, it's been me. I've been cultivating, I've been doing, I've been selling, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. The police officer said, and Gavin told me this story, he said, because you're honest, I'm not going to record a conviction. I'm not going to. Do you know, years later, fast forward, he's, he's in the ministry in Melbourne. He's in Newcastle. He did a degree uh, of, of, from something. I can't remember what. Anyway, there was an opportunity to do a one-year diploma of education to be a school teacher. And so he, I said, look, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? So he did that. He said, if I would have had that conviction, they would have never allowed me to become a teacher. It would have closed that door. You know, there, there is a rewarding reality. There is a rewarding reality. God asked, as I said, Cain, where is your brother? God only knows that if Cain would have just had a bit of a breakdown moment, an honest moment. God, I'm so sorry. I lost my temper. I was jealous and envious of my brother. I've done something so terrible. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. What would have been the outcome? What about Ananias and Sapphira? What if he would have told the truth? What about if Sapphira told the truth? Here's David, King David. He's been immoral with Bathsheba and, you know, then sought about to cover up the whole thing of her getting pregnant. And even to the extent of sending Uriah into the heat of the battle and him losing his life. And when Nathan the prophet sent by God confronts him, because one day it's going to come. One day God's going to come knocking on your door to ask some questions. Could be pastor, it could be Mum and dad, it could be somebody. Somebody's going to be asking some questions. And the glory of that situation is if you see it, after Nathan said, you're the man, and he goes, I have sinned. Do you know David had the power to say, get Nathan, throw him in jail. He could have done anything. Silence this man. Other kings did that all the time. You're right. I've sinned against my God. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. As the psalm says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Cre- create in me a clean heart. Right? Many people say, if you compare Saul, first king, with David, David messed up and sinned as much and has much problems as Saul, but David knew how to fess up and repent and get things right. What about you? What about you? Because if you live like Saul and some of these others, you won't be here in the long term. But David made it to the end. See, there's a great principle, Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes will have mercy. See, do you know there's no real salvation without honesty? If you don't have an honest moment, you'll never even be saved. We can't get saved. You can't get helped. You can't really get delivered unless you're honest. Our nations in its founding, Australia, England, America, New Zealand, our legal system is based on this. You know, if people... If they're guilty and they say they're guilty, do you know the punishment's less? Immediately. They take that into account, don't they? If you work in the legal system, you know that. See, we're set up to reward people for being honest. Church government, when we have to, you know, deal with some people. I I have, have meetings with people and ask them certain questions. I know certain things and I ask them about moral issues or about 
doctrinal issues or rebellious issues. And the truth of it is, if a person messes up and fesses up, it changes all the equations. If people are truthful, it changes all the equations. Parents, you know this. Reward truthfulness in your children. If you're going to punish anything, punish lying. You punish lying severely. You teach a powerful principle. This is a dimension of Scripture and the very essence and nature of what we're preaching is that the truth is for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not a surprise to parents, pastors and God that you've fallen short. He's not, oh my gosh, I had no idea. You know, it's like, it's like you're sharing a testimony in the Saturday night concert and mum and dad come. Have you ever had that experience? And you're sharing all this stuff you used to do when you're living in their house and And they go, oh my gosh. Or grandma's there and it's so embarrassing. You know what I'm saying? God's not like that. Pastor's not like that. Godly people are not like that. Do you know our post text as we bring it to a close in Acts 5? So, God, you know, this is quite severe that you'd have a church service with Ananias would be slain in the spirit, but not in the positive way. And then his wife, right? As I said, not a lot of chicken was eaten at dinner that Sunday, right? Okay. God dealt with it very seriously because his church that is founded on his truth Deception was trying to get in very early. Deception. Lies. God says, no. I'm defending and protecting my church because my church is the pillar and ground of truth. It's representing who God is. And God is a God of truth. We need people to believe. I mean, when we talk about eternity, when we talk about judgment, when we talk about the penalty of sin, they've got to be willing to know that that pearl of great price, I'm prepared to leave everything to get that because I believe that you're telling the truth. Can you say amen? And then look what happened. If you still got your Bible open, Acts 5 verse 11. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those that heard these things. Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done amongst the people. And they were with all of one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And the believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. The truth prevailed and people feared God and did right. The truth prevailed People feared God and did right. This is what I'm preaching today. We need to contend for this. Last night I said we need to contend for the Holy Spirit. This morning I'm saying we need to contend for truthfulness in our churches, in our lives. I want to bring it to a close because I want to give some hope. The Bible says there was a man named Jacob, so He's the grandson of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jacob has a twin brother, as you know, Jacob and Esau. You know, Jacob's actual name means supplanter or deceiver. Okay, so his father's in church. His grandfather's in church. He's got a great legacy. He's not only second generation, he's third generation saved. But he's brought up, so he's blessed. He's blessed in many ways. People brought up in church are blessed. But his nature is like your nature and my nature. It's deceptive. It's not wholly truthful. And he plays this out in life. You know, remember when he presented before his father 
Isaac, he's, you know, his eyes are a bit dim. He couldn't see and, you know, and, and he's going to bless the older brother before he supposedly dies and you know the story and he dresses up like his brother, puts his brother's clothes on, puts animal fur on his arms. How many know his brother was the original missing link <laughs> between monkey and man? This guy is a hairy dude. Right? If you put animal fur on your elbow, that's exactly like Esau. Good grief. Are you my brother? Are, are, you, are you my son, rather? Esau, yeah. <clears throat> yes, I am. Are you sure? Because you sound like Jake. No, no I'm not. So he's played the game to get ahead. He's deceived and lied. But one day, it all comes back, doesn't it? The roosters come back. The roost. And so he's now faced with the situation. He's leaving Uncle Laban. Sure, God's blessed him with family and children, but his brother's after him with 400 mounted men. Could do serious damage. In one night, he could lose everything he's worked for for 21 years. In one night. The Bible says he was left alone, sent his family ahead of him, and he wrestled with God. And God says to him in Genesis 32, verse 27, What is your name? See, a name represents who you are, your attributes, your character. And so he says, I am Jacob, a deceiver, supplanter, and liar. That's why God asked him that. And then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. A prince who has power with God and man. Isn't that good news? To every Jacob here. That God could meet with you and change something fundamental on the inside. Maybe you're a pathological liar. That needs to stop. Maybe you've told so many lies that you believe your lies. Maybe you constantly react because of rejection and self-worth issues. You make up stories. Maybe when you're confronted by authoritarian figures, whether parents or pastors, you don't tell the truth. That's Jacob. But you know, I, I'm telling you, it needs to change. If you're going to go on to destiny with God, God is a God of truth. If you're following Christ, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. If you're born again, you need to take on the attributes of the God you serve and we serve the God of truth. A true story of incredible deception. Let that not be my life and your life. Can you say amen? amen. Let's give God praise right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We want to bow our heads and close our eyes in a word of prayer just for a minute. I want to have an opportunity, an honest moment. I want to give an honest moment, first of all, about what's the state of your soul? What's the state of your soul? Are you right with God? Are you born again? Are you living for Christ? You say, well, I'm... I'm New Zealander, we all believe in God. My family's been in this church and that church nearly all my life. But that's not the question we're asking. We say constantly God has no grandchildren, meaning you need to have a personal relationship with God yourself, being a son and daughter of the living God. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you born again? Is He your Lord and Saviour? Have you believed and repented from your sin? Has Christ become real in your life? Or you're still living 
the old nature. Rebellion. Deception and lies. Holy Spirit's dealing with people. God is the God of truth here this day. And he can put a spotlight. He's putting a spotlight. And it's shining down into your heart. Even to your sinful heart. And say, you need to change. This is an honest moment. This is your moment. No one looking around for a moment. If you're unsaved or you're a backslider and need to make a recommitment this morning, would you quickly lift up your hand right now? No one looking around. God bless you, brother. Who else? God bless you, brother. Lift up your hand. Who else? Quickly, don't don't spend a moment longer. If you're unsaved or you're backslider, lift up your hand. Join all these. Okay? Okay? Those that lifted their hand, look at me for a minute. You met that brother at the back. You want to come? We can pray with you. Come. Come here. Let's meet you. Someone's going to come and join with you at this altar. Thank you. Find a place to kneel. Go through a sinner's prayer. That would be great. Thank you for those honest before God. Come and find a place. Kneel down at the altar. I want to give an opportunity to change the call for a moment. The true story of incredible deception. This is a challenge for us. And this is a character issue. What's your relationship with the truth? Well, pastor, I tell the truth most of the time. Or I tell part of the truth at least. But what about, what about in those moments when God or God's representative comes questioning you? If God came and questioned you today, would you be honest? If you mess up, would you fess up? This was an early dimension, Acts chapter 5, very early on in the church. And this threatened the very foundation stone of the church is the church is the pillar and ground of truth. We need to stigmatize deception and lies in our own life. We need to recognize, we just cross our finger a bit, it's only a small lie and You know, and I'm sure it's going to be okay. We need to stigmatize it. And in those key moments when questions are asked by God or man, that we'd be honest. Because there's a rewarding dimension. The reason why King David, even though he messed up in a number of places, successfully made it to the end. And the Bible says in the book of Acts, and David served his generation by the will of God. He served a whole generation. Oh, come on. What I believe is that when he messed up, he fessed up. What about you, brother? What about you, sister? Do you live by that principle? Maybe there's people here, there's really deep waters. Could be issues of rejection and self-worth. You, you make up things. You e- e- exaggerate. You don't tell the truth. You hide. But God's dealing and putting the light of His Word here that you and I would be believers and we would be a church of truth. I mean, when I stand, do an altar call. We have an altar call for the first love. We have an altar call for faith. Amen, Pastor Stephen and Pastor Richard. God's dealt with you. Amen, this morning. Challenge you to believe again, to love again, and to be people of truth. We want to have an altar call this morning.
God praise. Hallelujah. Father, thank you right now, God in Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's give him the shout of victory. Let's give him the shout of joy in the Holy Ghost. Lord Shaba Baba Basai. Yetere Budi Bokasai. Yendora Basinara Bosai. Ye Karabakite Ridi Basai. Epu Bosha. Yetere Bakandara Baka. Ye Keraboki Ridi Bakasai. Shedna Maramati Ribosai. Let's give him praise, church. Hallelujah. Oh, God. God. Oh, God. In the Rebbe Bessi. Oh, God. In the Bebe 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 Bebe. Oh, God, I'm a Samamanda. Here, a bossy to a bossy to a Oh, God. Wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost. God. Oh God. Oh God. Let's give God praise. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Wonderful presence of God. You know, in Acts 9, uh, 11, and 12, Pastor uh, Brett Nitta, you know, the Bible actually says that there's another Ananias later on in the book of Acts, another man. And the Bible says that as he was praying, that the, the Lord appeared to him and says, I'm sending you to go and meet a man. He actually gave him the street. He goes down to a street called Straight, and there you'll find a man that's praying. You know who that was? That was Saul who became the apostle Paul. It's amazing, isn't it? God was very specific, and God wants to as you're seeking him to give you direction to find key people. And so the Bible spoke to him. You know, so you, you just read it again. I'll just, I'll read it to you. It's quite incredible. It says in Acts 9, 11, the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one named Saul, is ta uh, Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he's praying. And in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come along, put his hands on his head that he might see. Isn't it? God set it all up? Come on, you've got to believe that God's going to set it all up. And there's, there's key people now. You've been here for a little while and God's starting to do stuff. I know that. But he's saying again, you need, to, you need to pray that and live in the book of Acts and look for that very thing. God, you give me direction. You told him even the street and the house. Come on. Is that help or not? And so not only Ananias, but even Saul himself, he saw a vision of a man named Ananias coming his way as well. God brought them together. They still had to do it, but God did all this stuff. I'm telling you, pioneering a church is a glorious thing in a, in a town, a city, or nation, and God wants to supernaturally help with key people, key men and women that he will supernaturally set up. You need to believe that. I cast out all unbelief in Jesus' name. 
Lift your hands. Let's pray. Father, release that in Pastor Nita's life and in Tina and their family. Release that in Jesus' name. I cast out all unbelief. The blood of Jesus sets you free. Lord God, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I want to just say, if there are people here that you've answered the altar call and there's things that you need to confess and be open about, then my recommendation is you go to your pastor and you get those things right. That would be my recommendation. Pastor will give you guidance. If it's to do with somebody else, it's a family member, it's a work situation or whatever else where you've been deceptive, still go to pastor because he'll give you the wisdom of what would be the right steps forward. There's some times where we just need to confess to God and God, you know, wipes it away. Sometimes we need to confess and make right. Pastor has the wisdom to help you in that. Oh, I'm telling you, I've seen some people so set free. I had a man who just confessed. He said, Pastor, I've been in the church and I've been bound in pornography 10 years and I've had cycles of three, six months. I try to do better and I go back and I go back. But I've never been honest. I've never been honest until I was honest with you four months ago. He said, it's changed my life. It's changed my life. It's like the person is born again, again. I'm telling you. He, he walks around like he's clothed with the glory of God. You know, I talked about Adam and Eve perhaps being clothed with something, you know, pre-fall. That can, there's a dimension of that that's restored to your life. When you're truthful, when you're honest, it's like a glory of God covers your life. Very exciting, isn't it? And so I would just say, I feel I'm not, this is not everyone. This is not everyone. But if the Holy Spirit, there's something practically you need to do. Some of you need to go to pastor. Maybe you've even lied to God or even pastor or somebody and it's in deception. I mean, if you would do that, God will set you free and give you his glory back. And that's exciting. We're going to have an awesome night tonight. It's Thursday night. I'm leading towards giving a challenge for missions and for the world. You know, I know we're only having a, a mini conference, but Thursday's always traditionally got a bit of an overseas feel. So I think we're going to run with it. That's going to be exciting. What do you think, Pastor? Can we do it? I think we can. Let's give God praise as our MC comes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, another incredible morning of ministry. Can you say amen? Uh, we are about to uh, close off. Uh, please, straight after the service, uh, go straight through and collect your children from the nursery. Uh, I have uh, had a special request, and that is one person, one person to go and pick up uh, the children from the nursery, not men, uh, not other kids and not aunties, uncles, and all your thousand cousins. Uh, just one. Uh, mothers or another trusted lady, go through uh, and pick up your children immediately. They've done a fantastic job. They need to be relieved. Hallelujah. Uh, tonight we're back at uh, 6 p.m. for prayer, uh, 7 p.m. for service. Uh, very, very exciting. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday, we have a seminar. Uh, that is at 5 p.m., a seminar right here in the building. Uh, it's going to be on Major Outreach Strategies Workshop. Hallelujah. Uh, who needs some strategies for outreach? Uh, you know, the, the, we are part of a fellowship, as Pastor Dan said. Uh, why would you try to make it up on your own? Uh, come in, uh, gather what other people have done, what works, what doesn't, 
you might get some ideas you will get some ideas hallelujah major outreach strategies workshop 5 p.m tomorrow afternoon amen hallelujah we're going to close off in a word of prayer uh, my brother pastor amelon yongo would you close us off Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Amen. Amen.